my neighbor. Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Please won't you be my neighbor? Oh, mercy. Do you remember? Do you remember? Mr. Rogers was on the uh, air for 33 years. And if you didn't grow up watching him, maybe your parents or your kids did. Someone saw Mr. Rogers. I love to come home. I have to admit, the placement of Mr. Rogers right after that beautiful song about the name of Jesus. <laughs> I thought about that, and I thought, I think I could have placed that a little differently. But in some ways, Jesus used that guy to make me feel safe, to make home a safe place, to make wherever I went a safe place, because this guy just, you'd see that little neighborhood that was so sweet and so beautiful, and the camera would, would focus in on that house, and then he'd just walk on in, and he just had a way of just making us feel so special. I love Mr. Rogers. He was amazing. No matter what kind of a day you had, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was that safe and wonderful place. Um, Marv, I'm getting a little reverb here. I don't know. Are you getting, are you hearing anything a little different about the sound? Well, as long as you're okay, we're good. Um, Hello. And we look at all those little houses in the neighborhood. I see all the houses and all the little cars, and it's just such a neat little place to be. But there is something missing. There's something wrong with Mr. Rogers' neighborhood in this picture. It's people. You want to know why it was so peaceful and wonderful? There are no people there. And whenever we have people together, there is always the potential for a little bit of conflict. Wherever there are people, there's the potential for a little bit of tension because God made us all so wonderfully different. We have different views. We come from different decades. We come from different places with different cultures. And you add all of our differences with original sin that was passed on from Adam and Eve all the way down into our souls, that little rebellious carnal spirit that wants our own way. You add all of that together, and there's a little cocktail for conflict. Read the Bible, and once again you'll see conflict is all over the Bible. It's all over. People didn't always just get along. You go all the way to the very first sin, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when God confronted Adam and Eve from, for, for eating of the forbidden fruit. Remember, listen to Adam what he told God. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. You gave her to me, she gave it to me, it's their fault. Isn't it interesting? Conflict begins in that moment, and it's infected our souls ever since. It was passed on to their kids. In Genesis chapter 4, we see conflict break out between Cain and Abel, and that leads to the first murder in the Bible. Oh, mercy, what a story. I'll never forget when my mom was reading the Bible for the first time through, and she would call me. Here she is in her 70s at that time, and she would call me, Honey, did you know that's in there? All these weird, horrible stories of people not liking each other, hurting each other. In Genesis chapter 13, we have a conflict breaking out between Abraham and Lot. They part ways, and Abraham heads for the high country, and Lot heads for the land near Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's not a very safe place to be. Conflict breaks out between Moses and his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam. They got all uptight because Moses was getting all the attention. He seemed to be favored by God, and um, that got them into trouble. And just when things were going so well, some 400-plus years later, conflict breaks out between King Saul and David, his successor. Saul becomes jealous of David's popularity, and then he begins to hunt after David. And, oh, there's such a mess for 12 to 15 years. The Old Testament is full of conflict. 
not just between the Israelites and their enemies, but between God's chosen people and each other. Hard to believe, but it's all over the place. And there was always tension, and it doesn't go away with the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem. It doesn't go away when Jesus, that precious baby, that divine all-God, all-man, was born in Bethlehem. Just look at the apostles who followed Jesus. Even though they sat at Jesus' feet, they learned from him for three years. They constantly bicker over who's going to get the best seat in the kingdom. Not a good example. After Pentecost, the first Christians had everything in common, the word tells us. They worshiped together, they ate together, they served each other. Everything's going great. But conflict breaks out when the Hebrew widows get better treatment than the Gentile widows in the church. And when Jewish Christians get all uptight because Gentiles are now coming to Christ and they're not following the Jewish law to the T like they're supposed to. So there's conflict. We see it before Christ, after Christ. Conflict. It's very much a part of the Bible story. And conflict is a part of our story. We love Jesus. But sometimes we have a hard time loving people even Jesus' own people. Have you ever been mad at somebody? Have you ever been mad at somebody? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> We've all had our moments. We've all had our moments when something's been said, something's been done to us, and we feel so absolutely robbed, and it's not fair, and we get angry. And one of the causes for our restlessness and our heartburn is that we never really took care of what's going on inside our heart. There may be some unfinished business, some unresolved conflict that God wants to address even today. If we were truly honest with ourselves and with our Lord, I think we would all agree that there may be seeds of something that happened to us some time ago that's still inside. And God wants to talk to us about it today. Maybe somebody's done something to you. Maybe something has been said against you, and you have that raw wound that hasn't healed. Maybe somebody knows how to press your button. It's just your personalities clash, and whenever you're together, you just feel the tension. They, they think differently, they act differently, and have different views than you do. And maybe the conflict is over something you believe or it's something you've said, you've said or done. You wish it would change, you wish you wouldn't have said it, but that was then, this is now, and nothing seems to bring resolve. Let me just toss this one out. There's something I've learned through the years, and it's this, that time alone does not heal conflict. Time alone does not heal conflict. Quite often, if we just depend on time and space, it doesn't take care of that inner hurt. We think that maybe just if we leave it alone, it'll go away. But I think we have to be honest, it usually doesn't. Most of the time, the tension lingers, and it affects our attitudes, it affects our perceptions of what is, what isn't true, and it affects our relationships even with other people because we didn't and we haven't dealt with it. All you know is there's, there's this kind of invisible wall between you and that person, and you wish it would disappear, but you're not sure what to do about it. Today we're going to talk about that. Here are some common approaches to conflict. Most of them don't work. The first is the head-in-the-sand approach. This person sticks his head in the sand and pretends that absolutely nothing is wrong. He kind of reminds me of Sergeant Schultz. Remember that old show, Hogan's Heroes, and he used to go, I see nothing, I feel nothing, I don't know anything, I don't know, I don't know. Some of you are way too young for that show. But there was this big old Sergeant Schultz, and he didn't want to take any blame. He didn't want to see it. He didn't want to do anything. I wonder how many marriages have split, how many churches have split, how many wars have started and continued 
because people knew there was a problem and nobody did anything constructive about it. Remember this haunting statement from the philosopher Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. We see it, we know it's there, we tiptoe around it, but we do nothing. This goes in line with a poem by a German doctor who felt very guilty after World War II because he knew something was going on. He knew there were concentration camps near, nearby, but he didn't do anything. He just kind of let it go on and on. And he wrote these words. In my Germany, they first came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because, well, I wasn't in a union. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was nobody left to speak up. At some point, do we ever go to a friend with whom we've had that tension and struggle, and do we just lay our cards on the table lovingly, carefully in Christ? and make sure we deal with something because it's still there. Unresolved conflict that we try to ignore really doesn't go away. It usually gets kind of bigger and bigger, and the walls between us kind of grow taller and maybe even thicker, and there's this surface politeness. We're all kind of nice, but that's not the way Jesus lived, and that's not the way he's calling us to live. We're all kind of nice, but that's not real love. Another approach to uh, dealing with the tension and conflict in our lives is the passive-aggressive approach. Some of us won't go to our rival. We won't go directly, but we feel free to tell others about the problem behind their back. It's sometimes easier to recruit people to our side of the story before we address the problem and we, we kind of need support. It makes us feel better about the way we're behaving. My brothers and sisters, let's just call it out for what it is. This is hypocrisy. This is sin. This is wrong. Not only does gossip divide our relationships, but then it prompts others to take sides and the problem grows, and it takes off from there, and it turns into something ugly that God can't use. And then we have the history approach. I love this one. This is when we not only go to the person and we address the problem, but then we bring out every other hang-up that we've had with the person for the last several years. Talk about ammunition. We forget nothing, and we kind of keep a record of all of those irritations. We wait for the next attack. This approach is totally contrary to what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that wonderful chapter about love, when Paul says, real love, agape, is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. I've heard about two men, and they were kind of talking about their wives one day at lunchtime. And one said to the other, when my wife gets angry, she gets historical. <laughs> and his friend says, no, 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 you mean hysterical. He goes, no, no, I mean historical. She reminds me of every argument, every little thing I've done since I've known her. Do you have friends like that? Are we sometimes like that? because we kind of let things just kind of pile up in our spirit. I'm sure here we have no one who does that. I'm sure the Holy Spirit is talking to each one of us right now. And what about the doormat approach? In the interest of being perceived as, as good Christians, we don't like to stir up any trouble. <laughs> no, because if we do, well, it may reflect poorly on us, and, and what will people think? No, no, just, just let it go. Because what people think matters more than what God might want us to do. So we go out of our way to avoid making waves. 
We lie down and allow this dysfunction to continue, hoping someone, somebody's got to step up and do something, but it's not going to be me. I look at all of these approaches, and not one of them resembles our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we've stereotyped Jesus to be some kind of cosmic Mr. Rogers, when he is our almighty savior who didn't run from conflict but stepped right into it with God's divine love. This is the Lord we serve. Think about Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible turned over the money tables at the temple because the merchants had turned his father's house of prayer into a shopping mall full of ripoffs. The Jesus of the Bible is not this nice, sweetie Jesus. No, the Jesus of the Bible preached not just positive, feel-good messages, but he preached to the core of the soul. And sometimes that had to hurt, but it was important. You say, I don't need to come to worship anymore. I don't need to hear from the Word of God. I don't need a small group with whom to share my life. But we need to get into the Word together to hear that living word of God speak into our lives. The Jesus of the Bible, oh, he was no pansy. No, no, no. This Jesus called hypocritical Pharisees, you dogs, you are vipers. He called his beloved Simon Peter the devil. Get away from me, Satan. He didn't do this because he was mean. He did this because he said what needed to be said. And they needed to hear it in the power and the love of Jesus. Never once do we see Jesus just trying to be nice. Filled with the infinite love, an infinite love and wisdom, he deals with conflict. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't exaggerate it. He doesn't run from it, but he deals with it, and he calls us to do the same thing. Now, I'm going to say something here as plainly as I can. We cannot have a healthy spiritual life and healthy relationships and not have some conflict. Conflict is a part of growing together. There are changes. There are things that as we're walking together in this this journey, there are going to be times when we disagree. But it's not that we should run away or pretend it's not there. It's that we learn how to do this and walk through our differences together. That we care enough about each other, that we listen to each other, and we walk through our pain together. And we have those needed conversations. God bids us to walk through conflict, not on our own, but with his help. Christ's death on the cross has already paved the way. As Paul told the Ephesians, for he, for Jesus himself, is our peace, who made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He made the two one. What is he talking about? He's talking about that Jesus made the Jews and the Gentiles, divided by centuries of hatred, two totally separate enemies. He molded them with his love into one by destroying the dividing wall of hostility between them. You say, I can't make up. I can't go to that person. Yes, we can. In the grace and the love of God, we can do anything. Jesus doesn't just talk about reconciliation. His death on the cross took took on all the hate, all the bitterness, all the suffering, all the molestations, all of the violence and prejudice that separated the Jews and the Gentiles for centuries, and he formed them into one holy church. Because of Jesus, these arch enemies put their division aside and they began to follow Jesus together. As Christians, they began to meet together. They worshiped together. They ate together. They listened to the teachings of the apostles together. And then when needed, they died for him together. In Jesus, they tasted a love so deep and a forgiveness so real that their hatred against each other 
gave way to love and putting God first. Through the ages, we have seen the highest walls between husbands and wives come tumbling down. We've seen the highest walls between parents and children, between friends and enemies, between coworkers and bosses. We've seen walls come tumbling down, even between Christians and the body of Jesus. We've seen them come down through the powerful, amazing grace that comes from heaven. You say, I can't do it. Oh, Jesus is telling us this morning, yes, child, you can. Jesus paved the way. But we have a vital role in this conflict thing. I rarely use acronyms. In fact, I think I've only used one here in, in the two and a half years we've been together. But in order for us to bridge the gaps in our relationships, here's something to think about. I believe the Lord, through his word, is calling us to go, to go to the person, not to everybody else, but to go to that person with whom we're struggling. Jesus made it very clear we're not to deny or we're not to walk around the conflict, but do our part to promote truth and understanding. Jesus told his followers, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. That's what Jesus did. Did you ever notice in the gospel story, did you ever notice that when Jesus was having a problem with the Pharisees, he didn't go to his apostles and say, man, did you see that guy over here? Isn't he a hypocrite? He's this, he's that. He didn't go to the other apostles when, when John and James wanted to have that better seat in the kingdom. He didn't go, man, did you hear what those guys asked me? And then their mother, can you believe those guys? Jesus never went around them. If he had an issue, he went directly to the person. What an example for us. As led of the Father, he would go directly to his enemies and talk to them. Have you ever had someone speak poorly about you behind your back? It hurts. It hurts, doesn't it? And there are times when God may, may lead us to just stop and God, through his spirit and through his word, may tell us, child, shake it off. Let it go. This is no biggie. My grace is sufficient for your hurting heart. Let it go. Fret not. There are times when God will just tell us, let it go. But there may be other times when the Holy Spirit will tell us, child, I want you to go to that person. We need to go. Not to let them have it, oh boy, <laughs> but to hear them out, acknowledge the problem, and if need be, seek or offer forgiveness. Going is one thing, offering forgiveness or asking somebody to forgive them is a whole different step of obedience. Now, I just need to ask you, why do we need to seek forgiveness? Why is forgiveness so important? Just what comes to mind when you hear that question? Why is forgiveness, why is offering forgiveness or seeking forgiveness that important? Give me some ideas. Amen. Amen, Anita. That's true. Amen. Yes. Why is forgiveness so important, my brothers and sisters? Think about this and own why it's so important. Yes. Amen. It's so true. Lonnie, it's right on. One of the greatest reasons, and I, I go back to the word, one of the main reasons we've already heard is that forgiveness is very important because our forgiveness from the Father depends on it. Do we ever really take this to heart? Our forgiveness from the Father. Jesus said, this is so important. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
God calls us to offer the same mercy to others that we have received from him. Regardless of our sins and our multiple quirks, God has forgiven us. Regardless of our enemy's sins and their multiple quirks, we're to go and forgive them. This doesn't mean that we'll be best friends. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be just perfect and we'll all be together and we'll all get along and life will be perfect. No, there is no guarantee of that. But if we let go of our inner resentment, we let go of the past, and with his help, we can move on. If we don't, we're stuck in this cycle of pain, of resentment, of always keeping that record. And you know what? The Lord is telling us this morning, child, let it go. Why do you need to offer forgiveness today? Well, I think our health depends on it. If you really think about it, what does resentment and simmering frustration do to our bodies? I'll tell you, if you don't forgive, you're going to get sick. It's going to have a major impact. The latest medical evidence shows that people who forgive, who let go of their resentment, benefit from a stronger immune system, lower blood pressure, better mental health. They have lower amounts of anger, anxiety, stress, and depression. Something happens when we just let it go. This incredible statement from Frederick Buchner He's an amazing writer, Christian author. He says, of all the deadly sins, resentment appears to be the most fun. To lick your wounds and savor the pain you will give back, you give back, is a feast fit for a king. But then it turns out that what you are eating at the banquet of bitterness is your own heart. The skeleton at the feast is you. You start holding a grudge, but in the end, the grudge holds you. At what point do we stop dining at that table, get up, and do what God is telling us to do? Not only does our health depend on forgiveness, our lasting peace depends on it. Our future depends on it. I read this week that forgiveness doesn't necessarily make the other person right but it makes you free. Can you own that one today? It can set you free. And one of the most amazing stories of freedom is something I've shared with you in the past. Most of us have heard this story, but maybe one or two of you haven't. It's the amazing story of forgiveness of a lady by the name of Corey Ten Boom. You know this story. She and her family secretly kept Jews who were hiding out from the Nazis in World War II. And the family was discovered. They were captured. And the family was split up in concentration camps. And she and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrück. And Betsy died. And Corey survived. And after the war, she traveled around the world telling people about God's goodness, his forgiveness, his peace. And then that forgiveness and that peace was put to a test, the greatest test of all. A man came up to her after one of her talks, and she knew him immediately. He was one of the guards at Ravensbrook. And since the war, he had become a Christian, and he came directly to her. He extended his hand, and he said, Will you please forgive me? Her sister had died, remember? She had suffered untold problems horrible things. And she wrote this. She said, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. I prayed silently. Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the stretched hand out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place, she says. The current, some kind of current, started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into the joined hands. And then this feeling of warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. 
I forgive you, brother, with all my heart, she said. And she said, for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even then, I realized it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, I can't, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. But the Lord says, when, child, will you trust me to be ready? What you lack, I have more than enough of to supply. We keep putting something off, and maybe our emotions aren't ready, but the Lord is saying, my child, this isn't about your feelings. This is about my love, and there are people all over this planet who need forgiveness. And if we in the body of Christ cannot forgive those who have trespassed against us, something is wrong. This has to change to bridge the gaps in our relationships. We first need to go, do something. But we also need to admit, a lot of us are pretty good at accusing, but God wants us to admit any part that we may have played in the conflict. So much more can be accomplished when we ask God to show us how we have contributed to the problem, maybe by allowing it to go on so long. We need to seek God's forgiveness and with his help admit that what we've said or done to our rival is not acceptable. And we need to do this before we come to worship. Remember what Jesus said. This is a powerful statement. He says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This isn't about what I'm thinking, but Lord God, if, if the Lord gives me an impression that someone is, is struggling with me, I need to stop and go to that person. In other words, if there's something going on, do something. If there's something undone, do your part in reconciliation and then come back to worship. If this in involves admission that I'm sorry, go for it. Regardless of the response, know that God will be pleased as you humble your heart and seek that person's forgiveness. And maybe here's a way to do it. I, I don't know. God will give us the words, but maybe going to that person and saying, you know, I, I sense there's some kind of tension between us, and, and if I've offended you, I'm sorry. I really am, because I want things to be right between us. I want to do this for Jesus, and I want to do it for you. Or if, if you know what you've said, if you know what you've done, just go right to the person and say, I sense that there is a tension between us. I've said something. I've done something, and I want to tell you right now, I'm sorry. What does it take? Love. Jesus. This is an all points bulletin for all of us who consider ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. If there is someone in this church family, if there is somebody in your life who needs this conversation, somebody with whom you've carried some resentment, God says, come to him, admit what's in our heart, and seek his wisdom, and proceed as he guides. He may say, don't go, but pray. He may say, go, but come to Jesus. And this brings us to the third thing. With all this going on and gaps sometimes in our relationships, instead of walking around, we've got to pray. Some of you are saying, well, prayer should be at the top of the list. Yes, prayer should take priority over all things. We need God's love. We need his help. We need his wisdom to speak into this. But sometimes when Christians get into praying, they never quite get into the going and admitting part. 
I pray, but then that action thing gets kind of left behind, and I shelve this for another day and another day and another day, and eventually the day turns into weeks, and this thing never gets resolved. The Lord is telling us, child, don't wait. If there's someone you need to talk to, if there's anybody you need to go to, by all means, don't hold it in. Stop this. Come to me, and let's talk about it. I'll tell you what to do. Can we trust God enough? And finally, we need to stay with it. Staying means if our attempt to reconcile doesn't work, we don't completely bail. But we continue to pray for that person. We continue to love and model a grace and a kindness. And then we ask God, please take care of us as well. I ask God, please give me the grace to see if there's anything in me that continues to need to change here, please show me. Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. If it's possible. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes when we extend the love of God, sometimes it's not received or it's rejected. But at least when we take that step and we attempt to do what God is telling us to do, something happens and we know that we at least are doing what Jesus wants us to do, and we honor the Lord. If there is lingering resentment, if there is something in your spirit that needs to be reconciled with God or somebody else, today's message is a wake-up call. Child, don't wait for somebody else. Tag, you're it. You know, Jesus stayed with it, didn't he? He went to the cross and stayed there until his last human breath so that every sin, every mean word, every grudge, every hateful act would die with him. He stayed there until it all died with him. And then he rose from the grave so that our sins would be forgiven as we come and confess and we seek him. He is so gracious and wonderful. We say, well, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's Jesus, but I can't do that. But Jesus says, yes, you can. I have more than enough grace to give you to get over your hurt, to get over your anger, to get beyond yourself, to actually care and love and graciously serve your enemy. I have a new place of faith and a new place of love that I want to take you. As Phil comes up and plays a closing song for us, may this be our prayer. That whatever I've heard today, Lord, if there's anything that needs to be done that would honor you, I place it at your feet. And I ask for the courage and the love and the mercy to follow through. I don't want to hang on anymore. With your love, I need to let go and do this in a way that would bless you. Think of that person with whom you might need to meet. Lord, before we go today, continue to speak to our souls. Remind us of anyone we need to meet. Give us wisdom, Lord, to be followers of you, to follow you all the way, to die to our resentment, to our excuses, to our blaming, and be able to speak the truth in love the way you do. We don't want to hold on. We need to let go and go and get things settled. May you go in the love and the peace and the joy, the immeasurable joy that comes in true obedience. Have a great day in the Lord. God bless you.